My name is Anne Fallowey. I'm a professor in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies, where my focus is, has been on the Jain religious tradition. And I think I was saying to Anita earlier that if there's any group that knows about Jainism, it probably would be you guys, right? Um, an interest, because the Jain tradition has such a huge emphasis on compassion to animals. I'm also the director of the Interdisciplinary Studies. Um, and that the animal studies falls under that. So I just wanted to do a, a shout out to thank uh, this force of nature that we call Lydia Schreimer, who, uh, who put this thing together. So thank you, Lydia, you have my gratitude. Um, and I also want to welcome the, those, of us who are, those of you who are joining us online. So I'm hoping that you can see the podium, more important that you can hear my voice so that you'll be able to hear our speaker's voice in just a moment. Um, yeah, so I wanted to say, you know, welcome to the first animal studies lecture of the year. But it actually feels more like an inaugural lecture in many ways. And that's because we're actually shifting the name of animal studies. So we've had animal studies at the University of Ottawa now for quite a few years, maybe five or six years. And it's going really well. There's a lot of students who are very interested in it. But there's also a lot of misunderstanding about what animal studies is. You know, so some, some professors and some students don't know that it has anything to do with ethics and with politics, and they think it may be a branch of biology or zoology, right? which, um, which, it's not, <laughs> which it's not. And there's another problem as well, is that those who are coming into animal studies, uh, or it's not so much a problem, that there are actually brilliant studies that one can do within animal studies that has absolutely nothing to do with the ethical and political dimension uh, that really is the foundation of this discipline. So one can look at um, animal symbolism, you know, and art, animal art since Neolithic period, um, animals in children's literature, this kind of thing that's fascinating, and I hope more and more people do that kind of stuff, but it need not really address the political or the ethical implications of real, live animals, sentient, living beings. And so for that reason, we decided to change the name and add it the, the term critical, right, as we tend to do in the academic space. So it will soon be called critical animal studies. And for that reason, I can think of no better person really to sort of kick off this, uh, this, this new expression of animal studies at, uh, at U Ottawa. So I first learned about um, Anita Krantz in 2015, maybe some of you did as well at that time, and that's when she became, uh, she was in the news, certainly in Canada, and I think outside of, globally actually, outside of Canada as well. And she was arrested for giving water to pigs en route to slaughter. And so this was an act of compassion on the part of Anita and the Toronto Pig Safe movement. Um, these pigs were heading into slaughter. She wasn't rescuing them, but it was an act of, of, of bearing witness, of observing their, the weight of their suffering, and an act of compassion. But she was arrested for doing that, right? And that's what made news, big news. Because she was interfering with property, right? this, was, this is the legal language, she was interfering with property. And that really tells us something about the different ways in which we can conceptualize animals in our society. Right? As property overrides the fact that these pigs are intelligent, sentient beings that suffer. Right? Um, Anita has a PhD in political science. She taught at Queen's University in teaching poli-sci, but also linking it with uh, environmental movements. So her PhD research was on politics and the environment. And then she moved on to co-found after the Toronto Pig Save movement. Again, I was just speaking about that. That was an act of that bearing witness of compassion, of holding vigils, was part of what that Toronto Pig Safe movement does and did. And then she moved on to becoming, I think, again, co-director or co-founder of the Animal Save movement, which uh, has broader, broader concerns, right? And they're really emphasizing the intersectionality between animal exploitation, animal suffering, the climate you know, environmental degradation, and human disease, you know, the absence of human health. And so linking these three together. And uh, that, I believe, is what we will be hearing about today. So thank you, Anita, for being here. I'm very much grateful to you for being here. So let us welcome our speaker. Thank you. Um, I, I want to say, just give a quick bio. Um, 
in the 90s, uh, I watched a film called The Animals Film, and that sort of made me go vegetarian, and then it took me until uh, I think it took around 2005 to go vegan. Um, but in the 90s, I was an environmentalist, and um, there was a campaign called uh, Clap It Sound. I don't know if you've heard of, of that rainforest. It's an old growth rainforest on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And joined, uh, at that time, I was working as a legislative assistant for Charles Katja. He's a liberal MP in Ottawa. And I saw it on the headlines. Oh, there's this blockade in Clap It Sound. And uh, my sister and I went there. And I thought I was just going to stay for a day, but we spent our entire two weeks there. There was a peace camp. That it was run by eco-feminists, it was vegetarian, uh, it was in support of the indigenous people there, and uh, it was the first time I got arrested uh, for blocking the road, and there was like a thousand people that had been arrested, so it was the largest civil disobedience movement in Canada at the time, that was in 1993. And then I went back in 97, uh, Sephora Berman was um, the coordinator in 93, and so she invited me in 97 to come back and join Greenpeace for a blockade for the Great Bear Rainforest, it's a mid-coastal rainforest in British Columbia. So there's about more than more than 20 activists from around the world, like Russia, Norway, all over, that got arrested to try to save this old growth rainforest. Um, so that's my history, but Sephora Berman figures in the story of the plant-based treaty that I, I want to talk to you about today. So um, the title is, I'm sorry, I was just at the Montreal Vegan Fest, but it's bringing uh, the plant-based treaty to Ottawa. <laughs> and uh, um, and the, it's the future is vegan donut economics. And I'm just curious, have any, has anyone heard about donut economics? We have one person, that's great. So I want to tell you a bit about that. Kate Raworth published uh, Donut Economics in 2017. She's an economist, she studied at Oxford, and uh, she wasn't impressed by neoclassical economics, like with endless uh, economic growth, linear growth. Uh, she had worked for the UNDP on the Human Development Report. She worked at Oxfam. Currently, she's a senior associate uh, professor at Oxford University's Environmental Change Institute. She's also uh, co-founder of the Donut Economics Action Lab. Um, it's a website where any of you can join, and you can connect with other people that are um, learning and applying donut economics worldwide. So that's her, Kate Roberts. And on the outer rim are the planetary boundaries, and the inner rim are the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Now what's so cool about this donut economics is it brings together the most important science, sort of understanding what you need to do to have a habitable world. Uh, you know, the nine planetary boundaries, climate is just one. You know, the others are like fresh water, biodiversity, um, phosphorus and nitrogen, the ozone layer, land conversion, you know, things like that. On the inner rim are 12 of the 17 UN development, uh, sustainable development goals. So the sustainable development goals are like education, uh, um, you know, uh, female uh, equity, things like that. Like all these, let's see what, uh, you know, poverty, mm -hmm. social equity. All these things are in the inner rim. And so in the, on, the, on the, the main part of the donut is what you need to do for life to thrive. It's a safe zone. So you have to live within the planetary boundaries. You have to meet needs. So that, and so that would be sort of the safe zone. So she was very critical about the idea in classical economics, uh, which many of you may have taken Economics 101, and where you discover laws, you know, about economic growth, supply, and demand. I'm just curious how many people have taken sort of a basic economics course, like an intro to economics course. Um, so she she argues that uh, it's not about discovering laws. Uh, economics is about design, like so it depends on what your goals are. And so she advocates for new economic thinking and doing new business models, re regenerative designs, whole system changes, and also making economists of us all, um, sort of being the change you want to, you know, you want to see. And so she says, drawing the change you want to see. So she says, just pick up a pencil and draw. So it's, you know, it's a question of design. Um, cities like Amsterdam and Melbourne are using donut economics. She's currently working with the European Union on, it, on, on how to implement some of the policies like the Green Agenda. A number of companies are adopting this model and she is now vegan as well. This concept was introduced in 2009. Uh, it's a really, really important concept um, by Johan Rockström and others by the Swedish Environment Institute. It's in this book. There's a Netflix film on it now on Netflix. Uh, the film is called Breaking Boundaries. 
same title as the book, uh, is narrated by David Attenborough. The intro, the foreword to this book is Greta Thunberg. It's an incredible work, uh, The Planetary Boundaries. So this is what it looks like when they did it in 2009. So when it's read, it means like, oh, you're, you're breaching a boundary. So you're, you're, make, you're, you're moving in the direction to make the world uninhabitable. So in 2009, you see some of the three of these in the red zone, like biosphere, like the biodiversity is in a lot of trouble. We're in the sixth mass extinction, as you know. Uh, biophysical flows, phosphorus and nitrogen, they're in the red. Came out in uh, Science Advances, authored by Catherine Richardson and others, uh, including uh, Johan Ruckström, I think. And they argue that six of the nine planetary boundaries are now breached. That was just published, you know, uh, in September 13th, so just last month, six of the nine. And I just wanted to show you this science journal article to demystify it. This is accessible to you. It's freely downloadable. You're at a university, so you get it's even easier for you to read these science articles. Um, so in this article, they show that in the 2009 assessment, as I mentioned, it was by biodiversity. Here it's nitrogen. It's being breached as a planetary boundary. They did another assessment in 2015. They added land use change. Um, you know, some people like uh, George Mombia, I don't know if you've heard of George Mombia, he's very famous in the UK. He wrote a book called Regenesis, and he argues that land use is the most important environmental issue. When you think about it, like, you know, land use means like, oh, deforestation of the Amazon, um, the Congo, uh, you know, the, the, the rainforest in Indonesia, and so forth. So. Uh, and that has huge implications for, um, you know, carbon sink, biodiversity, and so forth. So when they did the assessment in 2023, uh, at that point, it's climate change is breached. Novel entities, when they did these studies, it's in gray because they didn't calculate those yet. So this is the first time we've actually had some calculations for novel entities, like plastics, chemicals related to pesticides, and so forth. Climate change is there, is being breached. Uh, again, biodiversity, land use systems, also fresh water change is in the, it's already in the red. And uh, um, nitrogen and phosphorus. So planetary boundaries are defined as critical Earth system parameters that must not be exceeded in the long term for the Earth to remain habitable for living beings. So over time, if you breach this, the Earth will become uninhabitable. Or, and parts of it. So you already see this, like parts of the Earth might be too hot to live, certain parts, and that, that, those areas will expand as, as, as the average temperature of the Earth increases. So in the new planetary boundaries, um, this is the larger picture that you can see in the current assessment. In, in the new um, studies that they did, they added uh, three I's. So it's the first time they added um, interspecies justice. And that's something you, we're all concerned about. So I just wanted to show you the article and what it looks like. Uh, but again, here's the safe operating zone. So you see how we're in the red. You know, so we're moving towards the red. Um, so there's an article published called Safe and Just System Boundaries. And so what that means is it assesses and quantifies the planetary boundaries, donut economics, and the sustainable development goals together uh, to offer a, a safe and just Earth. So it's not just like a safe Earth, but also a just Earth. And so it includes three I's, including interspecies justice. So the three, and this was again authored by Johan Rockstrom, who is the author of this book. And um, the other I's are uh, intergenerational justice. So that is, you know, the seventh generation, the next generation, intergenerational justice. Third eye is intra-generational justice, so that's between countries, communities, and individuals. So when you look at animal farming, it breaches six of the nine planetary boundaries. So food systems are responsible for about a third of greenhouse gases, and in the case of methane, 32%. It is the largest source of any industry, or, uh, so animal agriculture industry is 32%. It is the main driver of biodiversity loss. It is uh, the main driver of land use changes. 
as we will see um, shortly, that you know most of the f most of the farmland is used for animal farming and produces a, a small proportion of calories, so it's extremely inefficient and wasteful. It's the main driver of freshwater change and use. It's the main driver of ocean acidification um, from CO2 and nitrogen, which affects the <coughs> pH of water. It's a, it's a main driver of biochemical flows. Phosphorus and nitrogen from animal egg is poisoning freshwater and saltwater bodies. Just zeroing in on, on methane. Um, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is the global body that assesses all the peer-reviewed uh, publications on climate change. And it has um, three working groups, one on science, one on impacts, one on policy. And the lead reviewer, uh, one of the lead reviewers, IPCC uh, scientist, Derwood Zalke said, climate change is like a marathon, cutting methane gives us time. Why do you think that is? Why do you think it's important to tackle that gas, methane, in particular, rather than just carbon dioxide? Because a lot of the focus has been on carbon dioxide, but you know there are other important uh, greenhouse gases like nitrogen oxide and methane. Does anyone know why methane is a very important gas to, to target? It cannot be captured as easily. Okay. Yes. It's more powerful than carbon dioxide. Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, it's because it can easily or like tear through the ozone layer. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh uh, yeah. So. So yeah. It's it's it. Methane is like a very potent gas. So it's much more potent than carbon dioxide, and uh, and it is short lived. So like. Carbon dioxide can stay in the atmosphere for hundreds of years, even a thousand years. So one carbon dioxide molecule could just stay there for a whole millennium. But um, methane, like 12 years. But it's much more powerful than carbon dioxide. So if you if you if you focus on that, then you know you can buy yourself some time to deal with this climate crisis. Um, so I wanted to go to the next chapter of the story. And look at what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, says about diets and which diet is the best. So what do you think the optimal diet is in terms of carbon footprint? It's vegan. Yeah. So the vegan diet means no animal sourced foods. And it's interesting the IPCC uses the word vegan. They don't say plant rich or use some other name because it's operational. Well, right? So when you say vegan, it's a very it means something. It means no meat, dairy, and eggs, right? So it's very specific. You want to be specific in science to measure you know, diets. So if the whole world went vegan in terms of the human population, uh, that would save eight gigatons here. You see, eight gigatons of carbon equivalent a year. That's a lot. Uh, some of the other diets, like vegetarian. And then there's like climate carnivore, you know, someone who tries to limit their use of eating ruminant flesh, like flesh from goats, sheep, and cows. So if you try to cut down on that, it helps. But it only if, if the whole world did that, it would be like just over three gigatons. So this just measures the direct greenhouse gas emissions. It does not measure um, uh, land use changes. That that number would more than double because if if you look at land use, because if, if for a vegan diet, it would free up land because um, a lot of land is used for grazing and animal feed. So the human population is about 8 billion. So this planet has to feed 8 billion. It's not doing a good job because about 1 billion of people go to bed hungry, right? So you have to feed 8 billion people. How many land animals are slaughtered a year, do you think? How many land animals do we feed every year? Yes? 70 billion. Very close. Anybody else? More or less? More. It's like, yeah, it's around 92 billion, if, you know, what's counted. Who knows, it could be more, but it's 92 billion. So on this planet, we feed 8 billion people, 92 billion animals are slaughtered a year. At any time, there's about a third of those animals, because their lives are so short-lived. So like, at any given moment, there's about 30 billion land, an land animals that are used for slaughter, right? But over the year, because they're slaughtered several times a year, and they have such short lifespans, like a pig is slaughtered at six months. When you look at the whole year, it's like 92 billion. And so as you see, like if still a billion people are going hungry, yeah, somehow we have food to feed 92 billion. And it's, it's, the carbon footprint is not great. 
So a, a study came out from the University of Oxford uh, just a few weeks ago, and it was highlighted in CBC, on the CBC report, and they interviewed a professor at Ryerson, Angela Lee. And uh, in this study, they showed that if a meat eater goes vegan, they would cut their greenhouse gas emissions by 75%, as well as water, pollution, and land use. So in this talk, what, one thing I want to emphasize, it's not just climate. That's why I'm talking about the planetary boundaries. It's all those other environmental issues. And they're interconnected. And we need, we need, all those, we need to worry about all those things to have a livable planet and to thrive. Um, and so a vegan diet uh, also would cut, 70, would have 75% less climate heating emissions. Um, it would also cut destruction of wildlife by 66% and water use by 54%. Okay, so this is a really famous study that I want to talk to you about. It's by Joseph Poor and Nemesik, and he, he's an Oxford University professor, and we did a webinar with him on Happy Street. So if you go to our YouTube channel, there's this amazing webinar for one hour, if you can watch it. So he is the most cited uh, researcher in the IPCC reports on food issues. So he's really well respected. He did this huge study. Um, involving tens of thousands of farms in many different countries, involving many different crops. And he, and he found that more than 80% of the farmland is used for farm animals, but it only produces 18% of calories. So it's inefficient. And you can, you can see why. Like, Say you're growing crops to directly feed people. Like 7% like of the soy is used for feeding humans. Um, I don't know, around 70% is used to feed farm animals. So say you grow the soy to directly make tofu or, you know, or something, or tempeh or whatever. Um, it's what, if instead you're feeding pigs and chickens that, uh, you have to feed them a lot. And then when you slaughter them, you can see how inefficient it is, right? So if you eat plants directly, you're really cutting down on land use, water use, you know, all the other things. So anyways, his study showed that. It's a very famous study. Um, in his study, he looked at the other, the different planetary boundaries. So it's not just greenhouse gases. So he looks at, for example, milk. Say you drink cow's milk, um, it, it leads, as you can see in the top bar here, it leads to a lot of greenhouse gases, um, acidification, eutrophication. That means um, you know the, la the lakes die from uh, there's too many nutrients in them, and it depletes the oxygen and the fish and all the all the marine life die with eutrophication. Uh, there's so much more land use and water use if, if people are drinking dairy milk. Um, so if you drink dairy milk, you, you, you use 10 times as much land than if you drink oat milk. So in, the, in these other rows, you can see rice milk, uh, soy milk, oat milk, and almond milk. You see almond milk has a little more water use, but still much less than dairy, dairy milk. So one of the best things you can do from an environmental perspective is drink plant-based milk. And from an animal rights perspective, um, you know, it's a huge issue uh, in terms of um, milk has been called like liquid meat. It's, that, it's as bad as eating meat because um, in, in some ways worse because uh, dairy cows are you know, artificially inseminated, their babies are taken away from them, they're separated. Uh, it, it results in the veal industry, the killing of sometimes bobby calves, which are just a few days old. It's a, it's a re really cruel and exploitative industry. So the next chapter I want to talk to you about is the plant-based tree. So I handed out some leaflets. That's why I wanted to start with that biome. You know, I started with doing some activism with, with uh, Clackwood Sound and Great Bear Rainforest and Greenpeace. And the leader uh, uh, was uh, Sephora Berman. And, um, so I knew her, and I, uh, when, we, when we were doing working on animal safe movement, we were just doing vigils in front of slaughterhouses. So we, um, you know, uh, and uh, Professor Valley asked, you know, was I co-founder founder? I always say co-founder because it was Mr. Bean's dog, my, a dog I adopted. We would, we would walk on Lake Shore, and we would see, we saw pig trucks. And I had lived in that area and did nothing. And so only when I adopted Mr. Bean, the dog, did I see the pigs? And I always say he's, you know, he's, it's a dog that really sort of connected us with the community, and it's really the inspiration. And um, so we were doing these vigils, and there's, you know, at some point there was like a thousand groups around the world, dozens and dozens of countries doing the same thing. 
So we go in front of the slaughterhouse, and when the trucks come, we bear witness. We look into the eyes of the pigs, the chickens, turkeys, rabbits, cows, um, and you know, we say we're sorry, we love you. Sometimes we're able to rescue a few, but it's you know, maybe a few hundred have been rescued around the world, but we bear more witness to millions, because as you know, there's like 92 billion land animals that are killed every year. And, um, but, and we start, then we started a climate safe branch and a health safe branch to make it, to, to show all the reasons for people to go plant-based or vegan and to become activists. That was, it was very much about individual diet change, like everyone must see this, is life transformative, that, that was sort of our idea. But we were struggling with our climate safe. We didn't know what to do. It was like beach cleanups or you know, screen a movie. Like we're really struggling. Like, oh, this crisis is so huge, but how are we going to respond to it? And so I, con I called Support Berman, who was the, who's the chair of um, the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. And so she told us about this treaty that for and th that had these three principles, like don't make the problem worse, no new exploration of oil, uh, gas, and coal. Uh, and no new development and so forth, and then redirect, like, you know, try to solve the problem, address subsidies and, you know, taxes and things like that. Third part was, like, you know, uh, uh, a just transition, like, help the workers and, you know, that kind of thing. So then we copied it. To, so we, we set it up two years ago, so it was really quick. Within four months, we set up a, a, a website, we copied the structure, and we didn't even know the structure we had. Somebody else pointed out to us that, oh, it's a pyramid, and we go, oh, okay, that's cool. So in this pyramid, at the top, and this, is, this, this pyramid is used in a lot of social movements, and I'll give you a quick illustration. Um, so at the top you have like, what is the goal? Like what are the eras or the phases? What are the campaigns and what are the tactics? So I'm gonna ask you, in the civil rights movement, you can use the same structure. So what was the goal of the civil rights movement? Equality. Yes, you got it. So yeah, it was equality, so that's the goal. So what were the phases? What were some of the main phases of the civil rights movement? Okay, like voting, right? Like voting. So what, one of them was voting. So, and then some of the, the, the campaigns that were used like were sit-ins, the freedom rides, voter registration, um, you know, the freedom summer, things like that. Um, another phase was desegregation. That was a phase, and there was a number of campaigns for that. And then another phase was, uh, uh, Martin Luther King, then you worked on um, uh, like anti-poverty, anti-militarism, you called it the three, there were three linking things, like, like anti-militarism, anti-poverty, anti-racism, those were the three things I had. That was a big, that was very radical when you went in that direction, it was really challenging the system, you know, like militarization, the Vietnam War and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, you see the structure, it's that pyramid structure, so the non-proliferation the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, they were really, you know, they really sort of know the history of social movements, came up with a really sophisticated campaign, and we copied it, and we didn't even know we had the pyramid, you know, and somebody told us, oh, cool. And so, um, so for us, the three R's are uh, relinquish, don't make the problem worse, no new animal farms, no new slaughterhouses, no, more, no new fishing vessels, no new deforestation for expanded animal agriculture. So don't make the problem worse. You know, currently the problem's getting worse every year. So you know, it's a, that's a big that's a big battle right there. The second one, the second R is redirect, and that is like how do you solve the problem? So like you know, how do you use um, change subsidies, taxes, regulations, community education, all those things to solve the problem? And the third is restore. How do you you know rewild the forests, the mangroves, you know, and so forth. Uh, the first R, to stop the problem getting worse, no land use change. Second R is promote a transition away from animal-based foods to plant-based systems. Third R is actively heal the problem, build resilience, restore key ecosystems. So coming back to what I, what I wanted to talk to you about is vegan donut economics. So, so Kate's book, Donut Economics, is about just all systems. We're, we want to focus on just the food system. So when you focus on the food system, we put our treaty inside. Because the, the grand strategic objective of our treaty is to move towards, a, I'm just going to go back quickly just to show you the grand strategic objective. At the top you see, it's to develop an equitable plant-based food system that would enable us to live within the planetary boundaries 
and reforest and rule all the earth. That's the goal. Like, you know, we, you know, how do you switch the food system so that we can live within our planet and grounds? Because as we mentioned earlier, uh, six of the planetary boundaries are being breached by animal by animal farming. Um, so, our if you look at our website plantbasedtreaty.org. Um, you'll see the treaty there, and it has these three R's, but it has like 39 detailed proposals. So we just picked some of them. You know, you put all 39 there, but we picked some of them. And um, so no land use change, ban live exports. I just want to tell you the story of live exports, because you might wonder, like, why would that be there? What does live exports have to do with it? Um, so uh, we, have, we have, had a save group in uh, Portugal that was at, at a port. Sebastian Port, and um, there were activists that were doing regular vigils there, of, uh, and then they were, they were live exporting sheep, goats, cows, a lot of sheep, to northern Africa and the Middle East. And you might ask, well, like, why? Like, because there's water shortages there already, and so these animals were being bred and fattened, and then shipped and then killed. So you see how this is a problem with like climate change, how export and import is used mm -hmm. is to just like deplete all the resources around the world. So live export is a real issue. Demand two of the plant-based treaty calls for redirecting subsidies away from animal farming towards climate-friendly plant-based. Uh, so you could subsidize veganic farms instead of animal feed and animal farms and slaughterhouses. Um, the Washington Post recently reported that consumers bought 8% less plant-based meat in 2022 than in 2021. So that market has climbed down a little, 8%, which is very disappointing. And um, they were drawing on the work of the Good Food Institute. But on average, plant-based meats cost 67% more than animal meat. That makes no sense because the meat, the animal flesh is so subsidized, it should not be cheaper than plant meat. But you see, that's part of the problem why it's, it's not being consumed as much. So the Guardian published, re reported on an article published in the journal One Earth, which analyzed major European Union and US agricultural um, subsidies from 2014 to 2020. And they found only 0.1% of the 35 billion spent on meat and dairy went to uh, plant-based. 0.1%. So like, this is why you know, you know, the, the, these products are not being consumed. One of the reasons. So in terms of our treaty, our theory of change is um, collect endorsements from individuals, groups, businesses, and cities to put pressure on governments to negotiate a global treaty. So uh, on our website, if you go, I, get, I distributed some cards, and if you go to the QR code, on the home page, you'll see that, oh, you can endorse us, you know, individual and so forth. This is what it looks like. So there's a tab for individual, business groups, and so forth. And then you fill it out. You ask for your diet. You don't have to be vegan to fill it out. You know, if you're not vegan, you get a specific type of email. You might get a, you know, a vegan starter kit or something. And you go on a different journey. So in terms of the endorsements we've achieved so far, uh, a number of Nobel laureates, um, some of the intergovernmental panel on climate change scientists. Um, the, the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty has 100 Nobel laureates, including the Dalai Lama, that have endorsed. We, don't, we have like a few. We have like maybe five or six that have endorsed. So they're always sort of ahead of us, and we're always you know, looking to them for inspiration. Um, a number of political parties have endorsed. There was a Green Party in the Netherlands endorsed. There's animal parties. The vegan conservative uh, group in the UK that endorsed. Um, the UK is ahead of us in terms of even, even right-wing parties will we'll we'll have a segment that are interested in this, unlike, say, in the US or Canada. A number of businesses have endorsed, like uh, Huera Foods, Happy Cow, e um, Ecotricity endorsed. Uh, Ecotricity, uh, they also have um, a football team in the UK that's completely vegan. A number of groups, including environmental groups like Chapters of Greenpeace, Friends of Chapters of Friends of the Earth. A number of celebrities have endorsed. We were so excited when Sir Paul McCartney, Mary, and Stella McCartney endorsed during Glasgow's COP. That was a couple of years ago. So overall, so far we have 111,000 individuals, 3,000 businesses and groups, and 21 cities that have endorsed. So the one goal I told you about is like 
you know, collect these endorsements to put pressure for governments to negotiate a global treaty. A second goal is local action. We can't just wait for you know, a global treaty. That's, you know, uh, we need to do local, have local action now. One of the main campaigns we're working on is the Plant Based Treaty Cities campaign. And one of the cities that have been, has endorsed so far is Edinburgh, the capital of Scotland. It happened because a constituent emailed all their councillors in Edinburgh, and one of them responded. There was a green councillor that said, oh, this is a good idea, proposed, uh, a, mo a proposed a motion. And the city said, no, why don't you do an impact assessment first? So last year they did an impact assessment. They looked at the three R's of the treaty and the detailed proposals, and looked at whether it was in the scope of the city to, do, to take action, and then they looked at the implications of taking action. And then they passed it in January of this year, and now they're working on an, um, an action plan for implementing it. And so the idea is they're creating an expectation for a pathway for a full transition, at least in our mind, you know, towards a plant-based food system. So in terms of the three R's, what can cities do, for example? Like they, could, they could have zoning laws that would prohibit slaughterhouses. And there are groups like Slaughter Free City, which started in Chicago, that have slaughterhouses, fighting slaughterhouses. You could ban public advertising for animal products in the city. Uh, several cities and towns in the Netherlands have done this, where they ban meat, dairy, and egg advertising on public spaces like um, public transit. In terms of the second R, redirect, you could have uh, plant-based events. The food purchasing of the city could be you know, plant-based. You could look at the climate action plan. So a city has a climate action plan if they declare a climate emergency. And a lot of the climate action plans don't say anything about food. So, or sometimes they might talk about food waste and um, community gardens. But they don't really have a food strategy. So one of the things you could do if you talk to your city councilor or the mayor is ask that the, that the city incorporate plant-based uh, plant food policy in their climate action plans. In some jurisdictions, in some countries, uh, cities have power to, to affect schools, hospitals, businesses. In Canada, our constitution gives a lot of those powers to the provinces. And then the provinces decide how much jurisdiction they want to give to the cities. The third R is restore, and it's about uh, rewilding, minimizing food waste. You can have seed hubs at libraries, and so forth. Um, so I just want to give you one example. So what would happen if Edinburgh went uh, vegan? So they have a population of about half a million. These calculations were done by Professor Joseph Poor, who I mentioned earlier, who did that very famous study. So he did the number crunching for us. So he said, you know, if 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 Edinburgh went vegan, 232,000 hectares of land would be saved, and that's an area the size of Lake District National Park. I don't know if has anyone heard of that park or been to that park. It's a really big park uh, in the UK. So that's a lot. So that's an incredible amount of land. It would also take, it would be the equivalent of taking half a million cars off the road. So um, one of the cards that I distributed to you is about uh, sending an email action letter to your city councillors. So we had to do the data collection for different countries, and it's really made an impact on our city campaign. So we did this in the UK, and over 500 city councillors have endorsed the Black Beast Treaty, and three cities and towns have endorsed. So we have Edinburgh, um, Hayward's Heath, and uh, Norwich have endorsed. So then we did the data collection for other countries, like Canada, um, we're almost finished in the U.S., Germany, Italy, Portugal, Spain, um, South Africa. How can you help? Well, if you go to our website uh, under Act Now, uh, you, you can go to the Canada page for the city campaign and you could send an email letter to your councillors or to your MP, your Member of Parliament. You can, you can make an automatic phone call as well. And this just shows you how many letters have been sent you just simply, the automatic email letter, you just put your details and it's a you know, list of 30, 30 counselors. So I'm just curious how many people have done that email action already? Because I know there's some activists that have joined us today. So we have, a, we have a few people that did that. So if you'd like to do that, you can just instantaneously become a lobbyist. And we all need to become, uh, you know, in my view, plant-based lobbyists if we want to you know, change the food system. Um, it's not enough to do street activism, in my opinion. You know, we also have to become advocates and lobbyists. So a city campaign has these 10 steps. Um, 
you know, you set up a team, or you can just do it individually, like lobby as an individual, but it's better to do it as a group. Um, you email your counselors. Um, you map the city. So we don't want this just to be about, um, you know, animal rights groups, like, because, you know, that's why we get endorsements from environmental groups like Greenpeace chapters, 350.org, Fridays for Future, all those things. Environmental groups, women's rights groups, indigenous groups, like all the different groups. Like we need to, you need to map the city and see how you can get support. It involves messaging. You know, how do you tailor the message for your particular city? Direct action is always important. You can do an action in front of city hall, banners, and um, you can, uh, meet with the counselors. So it's great to send an email letter, but even better is to phone them and talk to them. And, and even better is to meet with them in person. And you, should, you, you need to be very persistent. You know, the first time you email them, nobody might respond. But if you email them five or six times, you can always like change the message. Like you're, you can edit that. You can say, "Oh, I just seen this. Oh, I just seen this new article on the planetary boundaries, and I wrote to you a week ago." Oh, can you? You know, <coughs> persistence is important. Politicians are very busy, so you need to be persistent and make sure that your voice is heard. Uh, partnerships are very important, like partnering with a lot of environmental, women's rights, student groups, and so forth. Um, depositions. So depositions are just like statements you can make at City Hall. And you, um, so city, cities have different rules. The statement might be one minute, two minutes, five minutes. And on the city website, it will say who you email, you know, which committees there are. There's an environment committee, a budget committee. So you just find out, you know, oh, I'd like to, you just say, I'd like to make a deposition or a statement. And then you could do that. And the city um, puts everything on YouTube. They record everything. So what we do is we extract that and then we put it on our YouTube channel and then we have playlists for the UK, all the depositions for the UK. And you can see these people that did depositions. We have one for Canada. And uh, Mary Cerami joined us today at the back. If you want to just wave. And she, yeah, she's an organizer for Toronto Climate Safe. And she asked some questions in front of the but Environment Committee. And that's now we're going to get that video and we're going to put it on our channel just to inspire everybody to say, oh, this is, you know, these are the kind of things. So we're going to develop speaking notes to help you if you want to do that. Um, we, we launch petitions often for cities. I think we have an Ottawa petition for the Plant Beach Treaty. And then post endorsement, we do a press release, we get the word out. We've got so much media, but Edinburgh endorsed. LA endorsed as well. That was another city that endorsed. As another campaign that we work on are playbooks of best practices. So best practices for cities, universities, schools, early childhood education, hospitals, care homes, prisons, businesses, and, and more. And I wanted to highlight the example of New York City. Probably the greatest leader on plant-based policies is Mayor Eric Adams, so the mayor of New York City. So he wrote a book called um, Healthy at Last, sort of echoing free at last. And he, um, he had type 2 diabetes, and he promised that uh, like once he googled like recovering from diabetes rather than living with like diabetes he wanted to get better which he did he promised that he would if he was elected to mayor he would help all his constituents and that's what he's doing he's introduced policies in all these different areas so one is uh meatless mondays and plant flower fridays and for one million children in schools in new york city um, so that's two days a week, plant-based meals. In New York City, they have jurisdiction over health care. We don't have that necessarily here. But we, there's some jurisdiction, but not like in New York City. So he introduced Greener by Default in hospitals. So Greener by Default is like vegan by default. So in the hospital, when you're offered a meal, it's plant-based. And he, they do it twice. It's Greener by Default twice. So you say no to that, then you're offered another plant-based. You say no to that, then you're offered meat, dairy, and eggs. So, you know, if you go on an airline, usually it's like, here's your meat dish, right? You have to go, oh, I want a vegan dish. What if you switch that around and make vegan the default? You don't take anyone's choice away, because there's always, say, 20% hardcore media, so I want my meat, right? You don't take that away, because they can ask for it. Most people will be perfectly fine. You give them a delicious plant-based meal, they'll, they'll be happy. So, like, that's an important policy change. You see, it's different from the work I was talking about before, vigils and, you know, individual you know, diet change. This is about policy change that affects more than 2% of the vegans or how, however many vegans there are in the U.S. and Canada. If you do policy change, you can affect 60% immediately. 
So in New York, in New York City hospitals, 60% uptake, over 95% satisfaction and cost savings. So like so in in universities, uh, Green and White Fault is a nonprofit in the U.S. They are working with universities too. So imagine that being the policy at in Ottawa, University of Ottawa. Like if you did that. Students are even more progressive than people going to New York City hospitals. You might even get an uptake of 80%. Then the other things are like consumption-based emissions. Uh, like often climate emissions are production-based emissions. They're counted that way. And it's sort of like, it, obviously there aren't dairy farms in cities, so it undercounts the importance of food. So he's doing consumption-based emissions in New York City and working with London on that. Uh, with C40 cities. C40 cities is a big environment, uh, sort of cities group that works on on climate. Then there's equity, there's fruit and vegetable prescription programs for people that, that, that need assistance. And also for all mayor activity events, he serves, they serve plant-based. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, one of our campaigners, Alan Dunn, went to New York City for the UN Sustainable Development Goals discussions. And we asked Mayor Eric Adams for a proclamation, and he, he very eloquently said this in the proclamation. And he said, I'm pleased to commend the Plant-Based Treaty for its efforts to forge a healthful, equitable, and sustainable New York City. And in terms of hospitals, like, so what the playbooks do, they look at the best practice at the top. So obviously the best practice is 100% plant-based. But the second best is greener by default, because you can get like 40 to 80% uptake immediately. Another thing you could do is make staff canteens plant-based. You can install plant-based vending machines. They've done that at some hospitals in the UK and Canada as well. So I want to give you an example of how much power we all have when we become lobbyists and advocates. You know, street action is important. It's very important, but I think we also need the seriousness of the climate crisis and the other crises affecting planetary boundaries, I think require us to become lobbyists. And I'll give you an example. So Louisa Ombre, she, she's one of our, she's on our team in Toronto for the Plant-Based Treaty. She's worked for the government, the Ontario government, for two decades. And the cafeteria menu was horrendous, like 2,000 calorie dishes, like, you know, burger with bacon and cheese, and 2,000 calories, basically. And uh, it was all very meat-based. It was very, you know, not, nothing almost plant-based. So she went there, and she knew who to ask. So this is where the playbook you sort, of, sort of show you, like, what you do. So you find out, oh, who's the executive chef? Who's the manager? What is the food service provider? So at the university, you're gonna have like Sodexo or some food service provider. They make billions of meals a year. And Sodexo has a target of a third plant-based by 2025. That's not enough, but it's something. So, so she went and uh, so she asked the, the manager, he said, oh, like a few years ago, we tried plant uh, like vegan and it wasn't popular. But she goes, well, now there's the environmental crisis, try again. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> and so he did. And then he introduced what, Meatless Wednesdays, uh, one day a week, and, he's, and didn't use the word vegan. You don't want to say, oh, this is a vegan dish, because you don't want 2% of the people, the vegans, choosing it. You want everyone to say, oh, that's interesting. Oh, I'll try plant-based beef strips, stir fry. Right? So, so um, there are a number of NGOs that work on like the wording. Humane Society International has a campaign which they can help you with menus and they have chefs that can come in and train. So another campaign we work on is uh, the Global Climate Talks. As I mentioned, one of our goals is a global treaty. So uh, we have a food truck in the Netherlands and they park in front of the UN building in Bonn, which is the headquarters of the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. That's the climate treaty. And so it's located in Bonn, so there are intercessional meetings there. So in between the COPs, the Conference of the Parties, you know, the famous COPs, that the, the last one was in Egypt, the next one is in Dubai. Um, it's usually late November, early December, where all, you know, they, they negotiate the treaty. Uh, there are intercessionals in between that in June of every year in Bonn, and so we're there in Bonn every year as, long, as well as going to the COP meetings. And so we, we gave out 2,000 vegan sausages, as well as you know position papers, and we also did protests and stuff like that. So th this is the group of people that are, that are representing us in Dubai. And uh, so we're sending 11 people. We have Hashimi, she's in Georgia, the country, not, not the US state, um, does amazing work, and then we have Apergita, 
and Rajeshwar from India. We have a few people from the Netherlands going, including in the middle, we got Stephen George, and you can follow him on Instagram. He has like 30,000 followers. He's only 29, and he works for the European Space Agency, and he's really helping us with the planetary boundaries. And it was his idea. He goes, oh, what about donut economics? And then, then we just jumped into it. He just said that like a few weeks ago. We were, oh my god, this is like such a good concept. And uh, he's really dedicated, and he started a vegan group within the European Space Agency, and um, is helping us recruit other professionals. And uh, Stephanie is there, uh, you know, from Argentina and so forth. So we have a very global team that's going. So as I mentioned, like the McCartneys, they they supported us at COP26, um, endorsed the treaty in Glasgow. And COP27 was in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt. And there's just a quote at the bottom from Paul, Mary, and Selma McCartney. We believe in justice for animals, the environment, and people. That's why we support climate treaty and urge individuals and groups, governments to sign it. And finally, the last slide here is um, one of the campaigns that we do is uh, trainings and sort of building, helping build the movement. And so we have meetings every Friday at 10 and 2 p.m. EST, welcoming parties where um, we, we help individuals do advocacy as well as help, help set up teams. Um, in Toronto, we have, we have a, quite a large plant-based treaty team, and so we meet every single Thursday. We have a potluck, a vegan potluck, and an organizing meeting. And one of the things that we're doing is doing holding film screenings in every ward. So we have like um, 25 counsel counselors in Toronto. And so we're going to do uh, film screening, food and music, live music, in each ward at community centers, li libraries, university campuses, and then invite the counselor to come. And so that's one way to put pressure on the city to endorse the treaty and to implement me meaningful measures. So I, I wanted to encourage you all to get this book, as well as Donut that economics, so Breaking Boundaries, or watch the, the film on Netflix, like, it's an hour and a half, you won't get the full sense of it. It's really it's really if you read this book, and uh, it's on Audible, so you can you can listen to it. Uh, the same for donut economics. Uh, yes. Yeah, and just through like the lens of the law, is there any like uh, potential lawsuits that are that are kind of like in the works right now? Because especially with the food guide being revised in 2019, uh, and basically saying admitting that oh this is the first time we're no, not being influenced by industries. And it promoting the Mediterranean diet, which isn't plant-based, but still something. Um, in that case, like, is there, or, or in any other case where the government, kind of like tobacco, uh, saying that it's healthy even though it's carcinogenic? Um, yeah, I think that's like a, a, the next step for us. So that's ahead of what, you know, we're, like, we're two years old and we've started to put some of the pieces together, but that is definitely a legal strategy is really important and it's something we'd like to do. But um, yeah, you're right, like the Canada Food Guide is one of the most progressive food guides in the world. It replaced a glass of milk with a glass of water. And it, it you know, it's mainly legumes. It doesn't say you need to take you need to have dairy or anything, and most of the protein is like legumes and seeds and nuts. And this book is also not great in terms of not being fully plant-based, um, it, it promotes the planetary health diet, which is similar to what you're talking about, the Mediterranean diet and the kind of food diet. So it's mostly plant-based, but it has some uh, flexitarian aspect to it. Um, so the plant-based treaty is much more um, calling for an end to animal farming and a transition to a plant-based food system and rewilding the earth. And a number of scientists are like that as well, like George Monbiot, I mentioned, Regenesis. He's a very famous scientist in the UK uh, and uh, writes for The Guardian all the time. His book, Regenesis, also says, end animal farming as soon as possible, and uh, Joseph Tor, and things like that. So, um, but that just, I just wanted to, that's sort of, uh, uh, yeah, it's sort of very similar to what's here. Um, but yeah, but uh, yeah, I think a legal strategy is a great idea, but it's not something we're doing yet is asking about the impact of dogs on climate change. Okay, yeah, that's a great that's point. That's a great point. So yeah, um, we do have a vegan dog and cat food uh, campaign because, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the statistic with me, but maybe somebody does, but the 
A lot of animals are slaughtered for the dog and cat food industry. Um, they also use a lot of uh, the leftovers, you know, like the entrails of animals um, and the heads. You know, so they, they go to rendering plants like Rothsays and uh, the condemned animals are condemned on their bodies, they're thrown into pits. And then a lot of that is made into animal feed, but also used for the cat and, mm -hmm. cat and dog food industry. So, and often you'll see plastics from butcher shops, like, you know, the waste, but, you know, it's like very unclean food. A lot of animals are slaughtered directly for the cat, dog and cat food industry. So it's, it's actually a huge number. And uh, so, yeah, that, that is a good question. And we do have a campaign. So we have a free downloadable guide on, on, on vegan dog and cat food. Okay. Is there anyone? Yeah. I have two more online, but let's go yeah. back and forth. It's not really a question. It's about um, if you guys want to have more information, there's a vegan um, uh, TV uh, network. It's totally free. It's called Unchained TV. It's an app, and you can have a lot of information about everything vegan. So it's a really good resource. Yeah, just following up on that, Jane Bullets Mitchell was on CNN as an anchor for decades. So she's a very um, incredible journalist. And then she started she, uh, Unchained TV, and it has like you know hundreds and hundreds of doc like documentaries. And yeah, so I you know you can download the app Unchained TV. Yeah. And she endorsed the plan. Yeah, she's helped us a lot. Yeah. I'm wondering if the Green Party has endorsed, and if they if they haven't, why not? And like David Suzuki and all, I'm just wondering why the environmental movement is always so quiet about about diet. And are there what are the reasons for that? Is it just that it's too personal? They think it's going to be too challenging. People don't want to give up their, you know, their their, uh, their meat and uh, dairy. Or what's the reason that it's not more prominent within the environmental movement yeah. itself? Well, it, it is changing. Um, Greenpeace Canada uh, endorsed Greenpeace Toronto. 350 yeah. Toronto endorsed. Climate Fast endorsed. But we had activists like um, Jacinta, for example, in Toronto. She she's an organizer with 350. She she joins their groups. Like our climate change Toronto team joins the indigenous protest that happened last week, the fossil fuel free march. We joined that. So we show solidarity, and then it's changing. But to answer your question, there have been some academic articles on that from a few years ago. And, you know, address this question, like what's going on? And why are environmental groups not talking about this huge yeah. uh, source of greenhouse gases? It's a third of the greenhouse gases come from food, so why be silent on that? So the article looked at, you know, concern about donors, you know, concern about the staff and the campaigners not being vegan. If they're vegan, it's, if you're not vegan, why, you're gonna be, you're gonna have a filter which sort of discriminates against that solution. So they looked at some of those systemic factors, but things are changing. You know, there are, uh, there are things are improving. Like World Wildlife Fund is, you know, just had a horrendous reputation. I actually even protested them because they were like, they were supporting the Harris government in like hunting and parks and the Ontario Living Legacy, um, and that was in the 90s. I was organizing protests, which is very controversial. You don't want to protest environmentally, but they were horrendous, and they were getting money from Green for, from McDonald's and so forth. But now. They're doing incredible work on plant-based. So there is a shift, but it, it, it needs all of us sort of like, you know, advocating for that shift. And the staff is changing. Like a lot of the Greenpeace people are vegan. You know, a lot of people at 350.org where Jacinta was in Toronto are vegan. So uh, it's, if you are, you, you're not gonna have these barriers or these filters that make you biased against a real solution. And we have cultural differences Maintenance, costs, transportation. Okay. Again, again, a really important question. So, um, um, one of our activists, Yurim, is part indigenous from Mexico, and so she's really trying to um, support, show solidarity for indigenous communities here. And so she joined that, she organized the big contention last March. Um, one of the things that we'd like to emphasize is like, like the Amazon, um, there there has been a real war in the Amazon where indigenous people's lands and like rubber tappers in the rainforest itself is threatened by cattle ranchers and animal feed companies like Cargill and Monsanto. And when they eat, eat into the rainforest, they're eating into 
lands that are occupied by indigenous people as well as you know, biodiversity and things like that. So the big picture is, in terms of you know, groups like Amazon Watch, they're really concerned about mining oil and uh, you know, big, big, big meat companies like JBS. You know? um, and so that's the big picture in terms of like, um, like healthy eating as well. There are, I know there are a number of doctors that are working with like communities in terms of providing healthy food and you know, um, but yeah, but I, I, it's not a, uh, in our treaty we do mention indigenous rights and land and, um, and that's one of the goals is to sort of defend lands and not have further encroachment into these areas. That actually leads really nicely into the final question that I have online, uh, which is about, about whether there is any data that demonstrates a correlation between the adoption of plant-based diet and a reduction in health care costs. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, not enough. I don't know enough about the topic to answer that question. Um, but I certainly can try. I can get back to you. We are working with uh, Dr. Shireen Kassam. She organized the first. Um, plant-based health conference in the UK, and her sister here, Dr. Zara Kassan, organized the first plant-based conference in Canada, so I could follow up with them. Um, uh, they had a, the, the conference was amazing, it's all on you, you know, they, they have all the videos, so I could, I could get back to you on that, and I don't know the answer. Yeah, so, um, yeah, just wondering if, if you please consider uh, endorsing the treaty, you just go to the website, and uh, also writing a letter to all your counselors. Uh, if you just go to the dark green side of the card, uh, you can send a, a letter to all your counselors. And it's really powerful. It's a powerful action. And, um, and if you can share it with your friends and family, because um, the planetary boundaries are being breached. And the crisis is a lot bigger than people think. And change might not be linear. You know, we might get positive feedbacks. And things might get really horrible very quickly. Uh, you know, things are already very bad. You probably noticed the last couple of years, things are getting much worse. Um, maybe not here, maybe we're still, you know, sheltered from it. But, you know, we have the forest fires, like the, you know, you know in, in, in Australia, like billions of animals died from those forests two years ago. This year's going to be hotter, so let's see what happens in Australia this year. They're already worried, our activists are already worried what's going to happen. There are already a lot of uncontrollable fires there. There were so many fires in the Amazon. Uh, you know, in Latin America last year, in Canada this year, Unpre like I, I lived here my whole life, never experienced anything like those fires now. So like, just think about that. Just now, and we're not even at 1.5 degrees. If we go to two degrees Celsius warming, that's gonna lead to a lot of uh, breaching a lot of tipping points. So, you know, it, it's like it's really important to fight for stopping every point. One degree Celsius warming. Every point one degree Celsius warming matters. So you know, it's not a time for um, you know meek, or so it's not a time for like just like uh, you know fiddling with the margins. So it's time for systemic change. It's time for transformation. It's time for revolutionary change in our food system and our energy systems. Like it's really important. Like it's for your future. Like it's really and our all our future futures. So yeah, I really if you could please. You know, think about being becoming a lobbyist as well. You know, it's very important. Um, and sorry, just like because the U.S. with the laboratories grow meat being approved, um, do you see that taking kind of taking over that industry, taking over the animal? That's the hope. If it can happen fast enough, I mean, that's just one. Precision fermentation is probably even better and cheaper. And George Monbiot has more faith in that than cell cell grown meat. But who, you know, it's hard to predict these things, right? But um, yeah, I think yeah that, that that needs to be part of the solution for sure. But even just eating healthy, whole food, plant based. So if you look at someone like Mayor Eric Adams in New York City, he promotes uh, whole foods. So they did an ad campaign called "Eating a Whole Lot More Plants." And they had it for a month. So they had like videos and bus ads and um, eating plant whole foods, plant based is really healthy and cheap. Like buying a bag of lentils is really cheap and it's really healthy and yeah. Thank you, Anita, for this. This is uh, just sort of equal measure, terrifying, right, and, and inspiring as well. So it's just uh, been a really powerful presentation. 
Um, if anybody online or in this class is interested in hearing more, because I know that you're just this, this wealth of information, you have so much other stuff, that then you can contact me, and then I can perhaps uh, you know, send you the information or somehow get you in contact with, with Anita's work. Yeah, you can do things on campus too, like you could ask for menu change at the cafeteria, you say, yeah. greenery default or fully plant-based. In, in the UK, they have seven universities that are voted to go fully plant-based. You can do that here. You just organize, you know, and you have an animal rights group, you have environmental groups, just mm -hmm. ask for menu change. 